Thank you very much, Dr. Fan. And may I invite the panelists to join me up here uh, for this next part of the program? We had a wonderful introduction by Dr. Preuss, and uh, sort of setting the stage on the global food policy developments. And this particular panel discussion, we want to sort of delve in deeper and have a more discussion that is oriented towards what do we do to move forward? What do we do to move forward on the post-2015 agenda? And at this very important time in Germany, I understand you have some big developments, some real sort of more attention placed to development, to agriculture, to hunger reduction and so forth. So it's a chance for us to also have a focused discussion. What can we do more of, less of, <coughs> differently, for Germany to contribute to ending hunger and also to contribute to moving this post-2015 discourse ahead. We have a super set of panelists here. Um, Dr. Preuss has introduced them. You have heard that they come in with different perspectives, different experiences, different insights, and hopefully they don't just agree with each other, but they will build on each other's comments and help us to think differently. And I think that's what we want from today's session. Take from the global, come back, and how do we move forward? Our panelists have been asked to keep their remarks brief, three to five minutes, so that we can have a real conversation. Conversation among the panel and a conversation with you. And you is the you here in the room, but we also have a global audience because we are live streaming this and the audience that will come after the event today. So we want to have a chance to put some key messages on the table and we will, towards the end, come back <coughs> after the discussion with you and ask our panelists to give you, in one minute, the key takeaway messages. If you're only going to listen for that one minute, which we hope it's not the case, what should you take away? So let us begin with Dr. Schmitz. And Dr. Schmitz, you have also alerted us you have to leave a little bit earlier so we can be very generous with you and give you a little extra time to make the comments you might have made in the discussion. But let's begin with you. We are in Germany now today talking about more attention being paid and real commitment to moving the development, agriculture, rural, hunger, poverty reduction agenda forward. What should be the key messages you'd put on the table in terms of what are the key opportunities, the entry points and potential challenges to move this forward? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, if I may, I would like to, to, to switch to German, if I may, so for the one of you are prepared for translation. Is that possible? Yes. Okay. Yeah, vielen Dank. Thank you very much. I would like to say something about the post-2015 agenda. It seems to me that here, during this discussion, this is of essential importance. The post-2015 agenda means it's an agenda for the people agenda for the needs of the planet, for the needs of future generations. This is an agenda that brings together the development goals and also environmental objectives. The federal government will try to make sure that this agenda pursues ambitious goals in four different strategic areas. First, overcoming extreme poverty and hunger. Second, the creation of employment and income. Third, protection and sustainable use of natural resources. And fourth, promoting good governance, human rights, and peace. These are, as it were, the cornerstones, the coordinates that we deem to be important in the context of the post-2015 agenda. Now, when we talk about a food policy, if we say that this is dear to our heart, then we must not only focus on the first area of our strategy. It's not only about poverty and hunger. Food policy is not a sectoral policy. It is a very broad-based approach and it's a very broad challenge. No other topic in this, on this post-2015 agenda illustrates 
us clearly that it is necessary to find a sustainable approach to a comprehensive food policy. So it means we have to bring together a policy that serves the people and a policy that protects the planet. Of course, we have to deal with hunger today. That's not the question. But at the same time, we have to come up with a development path for our agriculture that makes it possible that the world's population can still be fed be it in 50 or in 100 years from here. And that is the real balancing act. We have to deal with the challenge of today and we have to deal with the challenge that concerns the future. We talk about agriculture, rural development, securing food, then we have to think all of these things together. As a consequence, Germany's government tries to aim at dealing with various objectives at the same time and at anchoring them in the post-2015 agenda. Let me give you an example. Overcoming hunger by the year 2025, the substantial reduction of malnourishment by 2025, realizing a world in which there is no degradation of land, installing sustainable agricultural practices, reducing post-harvest losses, better, more equitable access to land and other resources, and the support of a strong agriculture. And I would like to come back to that later. So this international support for ambitious food policy goals will be underpinned by our own development policy in Germany, and we want it to be exemplary. And we want it to help us in achieving the objectives I have just explained to you. Our new minister, Mr. Müller, has set up a new special unit, which is called A World Without Hunger. The financial means that we have for rural development, agriculture, and food security will be stepped up to at least 1 billion euros per year. Under the umbrella of the initiative, BMZ, which is the ministry in question, and will align its bilateral and multilateral development cooperation in a way that addresses all facets of food policy and food security. Food security, as we all know, is about the availability of food, but this is not where we find the real bottleneck. It's very much about the access to food. It's about the use and the processing of high quality food and it's about ensuring that there is a certain stability and a supply with healthy foods. We are supporting this in six different areas. It is about innovation in agriculture, in the agricultural value chain. It's about promoting structural change concerning rural development. It's about resource protection the access to land and other natural resources. And of course, it is about food security and increasing resilience. Because people should be in a position that they can deal with shocks or crises in a better way and have a livable life. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Schmitz, for that overview in terms of the German commitment, the German leadership, the areas that you want to focus on. I hope that we will have a time for discussion for a few minutes shortly after the panel, uh, but I really appreciate that you set the stage for us. That allows us to progress very naturally to uh, Dr. Schneider from Deutsche Welt Hungerhilfe, and you raised the issue of um, 
that it is uh, 20, uh, the post-2015 agenda is not just for people, it's not just for the planet, it's also for future generations, and you put in the, on the table issues of human rights also and people's rights. Perhaps that is a starting point for the conversation, uh, for the introduction that you might want to make. Okay, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking GIZ and IFPRI for giving me the opportunity to contribute to this discussion today from a civil society point of view. Uh, I have three <coughs> points to highlight on the reports, uh, which will be quite relevant for the discussion, I think. The first point, you mentioned it already, Mr. Schmitz, is the year 2025. I think um, up to now, food security goals were set from a political point of view. To half the proportion of people who suffer from hunger by 2015 is a pure political commitment. It is an important commitment, but it shows that up to now setting hunger goals was depending very much on the goodwill of politicians on national and on global level. Now the report demonstrates that hunger and undernutrition can be eliminated sustainably by 2025. All goals and strategies which fall behind this timeline are not challenging enough. Last week or 10 days ago, the Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals proposed to end hunger by 2030. Thanks to the report, we have the certainty now that this proposition is by far not ambitious enough and de facto accepts five years of avoidable hunger. From a rights-based perspective, we can now conclude if we do not manage to ensure food and nutrition security by 2025, we may contribute to the violation of the human right to food. I invite all of us, as did Mr. Schmitz, to pledge for this time goal, 2025. My second point is on the relevance of agriculture. <coughs> agriculture is the main driver for food and nutrition security, and it is great that the report and fund ray trades this fact. This is especially true since political and financial efforts to promote agriculture in developing countries are still falling far behind the promises. And yes, we need strong policies that promote sustainable agricultural intensification and new technologies. And of course, yields have to be improved and productivity boosted as described in the report. But the strong focus on efficiency and productivity productivity addresses mainly two pillars of food security, the pillars you addressed, the availability and stability of food. The other two pillars of food security, the utilization of food and especially the access to food are less addressed. Physical and economic access to food is not only a question of the highest possible efficiency in agricultural production, but also a question of the contribution of agriculture to increase the purchasing power and income of poor rural <coughs> populations. Weltunge Hilfe pledges for agricultural systems that are pro-poor and site-specific. This implies that we advocate for policies and agricultural systems that are not only efficient in regard to the yields, but also in regard to poverty reduction and nutrition, as already discussed this morning. The development of small-scale farmer and subsistence agriculture into an economically viable and socially and ecologically sustainable productive sector can only be realized step by step. So if you talk about structural change, we still have to bear in mind that production efficiency targets have to be balanced with rural development capacities. And my last point regards the coherence of policies. Global and <coughs> national food policies are heavily impeded by contradictory political initiatives. For example, uh, Dr. Preuss mentioned it already, industrialized countries are paving the way to become bioeconomies without taking care for global food security issues. Governments and companies are promoting large-scale agriculture in fragile countries without taking care of the needs of smallholder and landless. Both examples show how policies can interfere on different levels with the creation of an enabling environment for food security. In the last years, a lot of institutions have been created to shape global food policies and to enhance policy coherence. The Committee on World Food Security is a prominent <coughs> example. And last year, the voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure have been endorsed. 
And now I have a question to Mr. Fan. Is the impact of such resource-consuming initiative that low that the Global Food Policy Report has omitted to analyze their relevance? And the other question is, how can we reinforce the coherence between food policies and other political and economic interests? I think that to achieve the goal of ending hunger by 2025, governments and donors must pursue appropriate policies and investments in agriculture, but at the same time, they have to improve considerably the coherence of national and global policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Let, uh, you, you brought a number of key issues and we'll come back to them in the discussion. Let me move now to our third panelist. This is uh, Mr. Tassilo Galitz, who is uh, with BASF. And we've heard several references this morning to the role of the private sector. Perhaps some perspectives uh, that you can bring from BASF. Yeah, um, <clears throat> thanks a lot, uh, first of all, for the invitation and also the opportunity to speak here. Um, I would like to start with um, the key developments uh, we see um, that came over the last years. And um, starting with the high commodity prices in 2008 and the food crisis there, the focus of the public, but also the private sector, uh, again uh, shifted to agriculture and uh, especially agriculture research. Uh, we see still a more demand uh, for agricultural research, but um, this definitely created a momentum. And um, also the new thing here was that the private sector was an um, integral part of this development. So the private sector um, was more and more invited and, and took this part over. Um, this <coughs> led, for example, to public and private um, uh, corporations, uh, cooperations like the German Food Partnership that the German Ministry um, and, and uh, the German Society for International um, <coughs> Cooperation uh, is leading, but also BSF is part of uh, and, and um, happy to contribute to. Um, so, in, in essence, uh, public and private uh, tackle the challenges together now. And this is, this is definitely one of the, the key developments over the last years. Looking forward, though, um, the Millennium Goals uh, had their successes. A lot remains to be seen, and uh, key is the adaptation now to the new challenges you pointed out, Mr. Fang, um, to... Um, to adapt to climate change, uh, for example, or um, environmental sustainability. Um, but in order to do this in the right way and prioritize, um, uh, we need additional resources for agricultural research and, and partners to do this. So we're happy that IFPRI is, is one of the, the partners here and um, we're happy to work with you together on this. Um, but, and this might not be too, uh, too surprising from someone coming uh, from a technology, <coughs> technology providing company. Um, I definitely want to point out that the path forward that we want to follow to create resilience um, is sustainable intensification, absolutely. But um, uh, I hear a lot of agreement on this, uh, so, uh, this is just what I wanted to make, sh make clear from our point of view. And um, so um, one, one way we uh, contribute, I mentioned our, our role in the German Food Partnership um, is of course the PPP projects. Uh, currently we are uh, contributing through uh, two projects uh, in Asia, uh, both focusing on rice in Asia within the, the BRIA, the Better Rise Initiative for Asia. Um, in order to increase that, and we are interested to increase our engagement um, um, in additional PPP projects, um, we see, though, two success factors that are key for further engagement. And this is, first of all, uh, finding the right research partners that can help with the field work globally. And also uh, the other one, 
finding the support of governments, of course, uh, to uh, create the, the legal frameworks to share our technologies, but also to, to apply our technologies. And, and with the, these uh, two, two main goals, main um, uh, prerequisites, uh, we, we are happy to engage um, even further. And Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dalit. <laughs> we put on the table various success factors to scale up the uh, engagement with the private sector. Let me now come to our last panelist, and uh, Dr. Messner, perhaps some pictures, and I, I'm picking up also on the planetary theme that uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Schmitz has also put on the table, yeah. and any other key issues that you see. Right. Yeah. Reacting. Also, first of all, I would like to congratulate you. This is a wonderful report and I really appreciate it and, and, and love to read it because you are one of the leaders in this field. And when I reflect on, these, on the food security issue, I do have actually uh, four arenas or four levels in mind. Uh, the first level is what you, Mr. Fenn, talked about. It is about agricultural policy. So it is about agricultural productivity. It is about how to integrate smallhold farm farmers in local markets and global value chains. It's about technology. It's about how to bring social protection policies and agricultural policies together, access to food. You know, so the focus on the sector embedded in the environment. You know, so this is the first arena which I see. The second arena then is a country-specific view. And this has to do, I think, with your 2025 target. Because we see that the most, uh, most difficult challenges which we have in terms of food security issues are concentrated in 25 to 30 countries, all of them driven by war, very bad governance and failing states. So we need very specific strategies for these kind of countries to really reduce hunger in these countries. Because what the, your report is again demonstrating is that if countries do have a good policy, more or less working institutions, you invest in education, uh, things work. But what are we going to do in these 25 countries? So food security is also about stabilizing countries, bringing good governance into very difficult situations, and managing failing states in the context of food security policies. And I think we need to answer the question, what can we do specifically in these countries to get your target right? So this is the second arena. The third arena is about human behavior then. So this is what we all can contribute to. And the numbers, uh, when it comes to human behavior, are very important in terms of pressure on land. You know? And two dimensions are key here when we talk about human behavior. The first is uh, food waste. You know, we all know in our OECD countries, and the trend is completely the same in emerging economies like Brazil and China and other countries now, we, are, uh, we do have a food waste percentage of around 30%. So we buy food and then <laughs> we do have waste around 30%. And this, of course, is a huge pressure on land. Uh, when we bring productivity gains together with these food loss issues, we probably would see that uh, bringing down food loss to 5% would have a much bigger leverage in terms of pressure on land than any productivity gain which we might have in mind for the next 10, 15 years. So the second dimension when we talk about human behavior is our food consumption patterns. No? This is about meat. <laughs> I mean, if we would consume in our countries in the OECD world, but now also with the same trends in, in China and other emerging economies, if we would consume what the World Health Organization is recommended to us, so if we would consume in a healthy way, we would put down the pressure on land considerably. No? This is what we can do. And again, if we bring, bring this together in relation with uh, productivity gains, which we do have in mind with the ex technologies which we know and the policies which we know, the leverage point of these behavioral dimensions is larger. This is an important point because this is something which we can do in uh, OECD countries. No, this is not on productivity, technology, agricultural policies in the developing countries. Of course, we have to do a lot of things there. No? This is why I started with the first field. But human behavior, we can do a lot of things and the leverage is huge. No? It's more important in terms of what we could um, manage better uh, to reduce um, um, pressure on soil and agricultural land when we look at um, behavioral changes. So my third, uh, my, my fourth uh, dimension is then, I talked about the sector, I talked about uh, these difficult countries, bad governance, war-driven, what can we do there? I talked about human behavior. My fourth dimension is long-term and global. 
long-term and global. Uh, I am chairing also the German Advisory Council on Global Change, and uh, last week we presented to our government a paper which is called in German, Zivilisatorischer Fortschritt innerhalb der planetarischen Leitplanken. So it's human development <laughs> within the planetary boundaries. Nice. Within the planetary boundaries, because what we need to have in mind when we look towards the next 50 or 100 years, you took this long-term uh, pers uh, perspective, Mr. Schmitz, and I agree completely with you, well, we need to know that we are moving towards several planetary boundaries. Uh, we define in this uh, paper here six uh, planetary boundaries, which we perceive as very relevant for the next uh, half of a century or so, and four of those are of critical importance for agriculture and therefore food and uh, food security. So the four planetary boundaries which we see and which we need to have in mind and which we would like to see as a part of the post-2015 percent, these four planetary boundaries are the following. The first one is, of course, climate change. So if we run towards three to four degrees uh, Celsius, everything what we do on the productivity side uh, will uh, lose an, on importance no? because resilience will become a real challenge and land degradation will uh, move forward and weather events, strong weather, weather events will, will challenge as you talked about adaptation. So climate change is the first planetary boundary. Again, we in our countries can do a lot for food security, bringing our emissions down. No? The German Energiewende is very important for food security, therefore. No? The second point is land degradation. As you show again in your report, land degradation is still uh, accelerating. So we suggest to reduce to zero land degradation uh, towards 2030. So having a global agricultural system which is land degradation neutral by 2030. Second planetary boundary. Third planetary boundary, acidification of the oceans. This has to do also with climate change, with our emissions. If fishery goes down, pressure on land will rise. <laughs> no? So stop acidification of oceans is very important for food security and for how we use agricultural land. And the fourth planetary boundary <coughs> is uh, the availability of phosphor. No? Most data are showing that we might have even passed uh, peak phosphor in 1989. Others argue very optimistically with, that we might uh, pass the peak of phosphor production in 2030. Phosphor is currently an ingredient for agricultural production which we do not have a substitute for. So we are running into a phosphor peak situation and we do not have every, any uh, substitute for that. So in our paper here, we argue that by 2050, at the latest, we need to, to work with phosphor in a cycle, in a cycle economic structure. We do not know how to do that. We do not have the technolo technology still. We do not have the policy still. This is urgent because phosphor is absolutely critical for agricultural productivity. So having these global uh, guardrails in mind is my fourth agenda, my, my, my fourth uh, playing field. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we've had an absolutely fascinating set of uh, introductory remarks and comments over here from the planetary boundaries to how do we have work uh, to basically move forward in the 2025 to basically some of the key issues, success factors for the private sector to work more closely with the public sector and so forth. I want to come to you, Mr. Schmitz, uh, Dr. Schmitz, before uh, yeah. you have to run away <laughs> <laughs> because you've heard several different comments over here and I would be intrigued to hear from you two or three things and to also have you reflect, but country specific has come up in several instances. And I may have missed this in translation, but I didn't quite get the sense of German cooperation moving ahead. What are you going to do differently or what not in terms of working at the country level or supporting? The other thing I would like to hear from you a little bit more is this contradictory policies, coherence of policies. What role do you see Germany playing in helping to bring about that very key sort of uh, um, 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 enabling environment at the country level where not necessarily investment but just coherence of policies. And the third thing that I would be particularly interested to hear is working with partners for, from the German cooperation side. How would you like to work with partners that you're not already doing? You know, what do you want to put on the table with them? You know, but these are just my comments. You have heard them. What comes to your mind? Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. 
um, yes, uh, regarding uh, your uh, uh, question, how country-specific are we? This is one point. M the, the absolute majority of uh, the, 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 the financial resources I, I mentioned will go into country programs, and they go into country-specific programs, reacting to the country need, respecting uh, countries' demands, their ownership. We uh, try our best to align our programs with country priorities. The whole. The, the whole story of aid, aid effectiveness, we, 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 stick to, mm -hmm. we stick to that. So I think this is quite clear. And it, we identify uh, specific countries where addressing governance mm -hmm. is the key concern. And we are addressing con other countries where uh, productivity growth is a main concern, other where the protection of natural resources, uh, addressing soil degradation, and so is, is a main concern. We, we are currently working exactly on, on, on that. Um, regarding uh, coherence, yes, I mean, this is, a, this is really a, 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 gr a great challenge. And I think most important here is to, to linking environmental uh, concerns, addressing the planetary boundaries, as, as you said. I, see, I take this as um, a confirmation of what we are really a, a aiming to do. We, on the one hand, we, we aim to produce more with less, more output, less input, but at the same time, and you really made a, a, a very good point, uh, uh, Mr. Messner, um, we also have to consume less yeah, to get the same, the same results. Re address, um, uh, redress food waste, address the issue of what we all can do in industrialized countries. And this is the flip side of environmental policy. We have to bring this together. We, have, we neglected that for, for, for far, far too long. Um, third point uh, regarding partners, yes, we do. The reason I have to leave now, because I am with our um, deputy minister in, in, in 20 minutes now, he meets uh, a delegation from FARA for example, the Forum of Agricultural Research oh. in Africa. We try to enter into cooperation with FARA, because we <coughs> think at this strategic level, um, agricultural research and the promotion of the transfer of research into practice, of knowledge into broad implication on the ground, is one of the key, key points we have to address. So, thanks very much. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> So I know you have to leave, just walk when you need it's to. Sharp. We will okay. continue the conversation here. Is there anything you want to ask the panelists before you leave? Hmm. I would like to, but I'm sorry I have to leave. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Right. So. Thank you. If you will allow me, I would like to just pursue a short conversation with our panelists and then come to you in just about three to five minutes or so. And I hope, please, save your questions, your comments, to ask them and to ask each other. Um, but I would like to come back to our three panelists over here. You heard each other, and I want to pick up on this planetary boundaries for a moment and make the connection. And so, Dr. Schneider, question for you. Picking up on these key issues of land degradation, for instance, picking up, and those are of key issues in the developing countries that you work, climate change, <coughs> how would you, from the NGO perspective, where do you see the NGO, the civil society in Germany, contributing to moving some of these key discourses. You know, where do you see the entry points? Um, we have two entry points. We have the first entry point is our project work with partners in developing countries, where of course we all activities have the goal of sustainability and sustainable development. The problem with the planetary boundaries is that we still need development in these countries and this is always resource consuming. So they have to develop for poverty reduction and food security within the boundaries, but I don't always feel us in the North who overexploited the planetary boundaries to tell to our partners in the South how to manage their development in regard to the planetary boundaries. So we need always a development of food security in food security issues 
an agenda <coughs> which allows the people who need development, who are in need of poverty reduction, okay. to um, win some space in between the planetary boundaries which are not really fixed yet. Yeah? This is the, the biggest difficulty. Of course, we don't want to enhance land, land degradation, but we want that the people can expand their agriculture, transform their agricultural systems, and that will be resource consuming on different levels. This is one point. Of course, the other point is very important for us from the, north, from the south that we campaign against food waste, food losses, um, starting from the education at school um, with young pupils to introduce these issues of um, resource limitations uh, in our behavior and our lifestyle, which is quite difficult because as we are sitting here, we all have to keep in mind, do we walk the way we talk? We all ask for another lifestyle, but we all live the old <coughs> lifestyle. And when we talk about political coherence, just look at the German government, which is asking the European Union to expand the um, CO2 emissions for cars for the next five years, instead of getting them down to a level which is perhaps acceptable. So you see that on this level, we know about our lifestyle, we know about the political issues, uh, but the decisions on the political level and on each individual are still on the old track. So another thing we should do is now to start to walk the talk uh, about our lifestyles. Okay, you, you put on the table and I saw you nodding your head, Dirk. <laughs> so do you want to come yeah. back on the planetary boundaries? Yeah, uh -huh. I would like and, 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 But we don't get stuck on them, okay? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and please go ahead. Yeah. No, um, the, the, your question is very important because the, we do have this kind of discussion with uh, many G77 countries or people living in developing countries. You know, so how can we bring together planetary boundaries with, with, with human development? You know, and my answer would be threefold. You know, the, my first answer is that with the data which we have on all the resources, agricultural land and others, we can demonstrate that we do have enough resources to organize human progress and development for the, for the uh, bottom 2.5 billion people on Earth. That's not a problem. No? This is not the challenge. The resources for these people are there. This is the first answer. The second answer is that if we pass these planetary boundaries and run into these tipping point uh, situations, I mean, if phosphor would run out, what would we do globally? No? Uh, the most vulnerable, of course, would then be the poorest on Earth. So it is in the interest of the poorest on Earth to have these planetary boundaries as part of our development policy packages, because if not, they will be the most vulnerable ones. No? Others can protect them themselves which, uh, with monetary resources. No? And my third answer would then be, and this is your point, um, at the end of the day, and this is a tough discussion, no? middle and upper classes in our global society need to adapt their production and consumption patterns. And we need to talk about the production patterns and the consumption patterns at the same time. And to talk about productivity gains is always more easily to, to, to reflect on. People feel comfortable, no? because the major feeling is that, okay, we move forward, technology is there, we will solve these kind of things by efficiency. But we know that it has also to do with behavioral change. No? I talked about uh, food waste and our consumption pattern regarding meat consumption. No? And this is an, it, it's an important leverage. So we have to have this in mind also. Uh, this implies that when we talk about food security, it's not only about investments in the poorest countries on Earth. It's it, it is about policy reforms in our countries too. And this is what is, for me, so important uh, when we reflect about the shift from the MDGs, which have been focusing only on other countries need to adapt, developing countries. No? Now we talk about universal development goals, and the message from the planetary boundary perspective is that we have to adapt too, in our uh, rich countries. No? Sounds good. Now, any, do, do Schengen or uh, Tassilo, do you want to react? Otherwise, I open up for the audience here. And uh, there was a very specific question also to you, uh, Schengen, from uh, Raphael over here on uh, s several questions, particularly on the um, research, um, the coherence with the political. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to pick up now or come back later. Uh, probably a couple of issues. One is, um, okay, why we have so much inefficiency in using natural resources, whether we will reach the um, planetary boundaries. To me, it seems to me we're failed in, in these two or three areas. One is obviously technology. 
there are good technologies that can help to reduce the use of natural resources and produce more food. So the chapter, I think chapter two of this report is about sustainable food production. Mm -hmm. We analyze 11 technologies, how these technologies can produce more food and save natural resources. Another action is a policy. Policy failure. We still subsidize fertilizers, water, electricity, and the fuels. This subsidy is actually cause overuse of this, this natural resource. When it's cheap, when it's free, we overuse it. So in China and India, 40% of the fertilizers are wasted. So that not only mm -hmm. cause the uh, inefficient use of fertilizer, but also the carbon emission, uh, methane, methane emission, contribute to carbon emission. So that's uh, uh, probably two comments I wanted to add. I will come back okay. later. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sounds good. Tassilo? Yeah. <coughs> Of course, planetary boundaries, but uh, it's it's also uh, more is not even always better. That's clear. That's also clear to us. Um, uh, and it's not only about using smart technologies, uh, but uh, also about using technologies in a smart way. And I think both aspects are very important. And and. Um, I listen to you all, and I totally agree. I mean, uh, <coughs> we have the technologies, and I'm not talking about only about fertilizers, about uh, crop protection products, pesticides. Um, we have also other technologies that can help to, um, to uh, overcome the challenge of food security in a, in a way that is also environmentally friendly and that is also contributing to resource efficiency. So um, I think we, we all agree here that technologies are needed. It's about how and when and, and on a case-by-case -case basis they, they are used. So.